Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is Thursday, December 9th, 2021, and this is the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that dares to dig just a little bit deeper, and we're going to dig especially deep tonight for our very first interview episode, a very special episode. Hi, buddy. My name is Jonathan Betzler, one of your hosts here in my home in Los Angeles, at least for the time being. I, for one, have long wanted to interview some of the creatives of the films that we've reviewed and admired on the show. Finally, we get that opportunity as we talk to the writers of the film, Downloading Nancy which was one of our indie spotlights in 2019, which was the year that we were spotlighting indies from 2009, a 10-year difference. It's episode 59.2 to be exact. At press time, it is the third most viewed show uh, of ours on YouTube. Um, and so it's only appropriate for this to be our very first interview. And to join me for the interview, it's only appropriate to have the guys back who review the film with me back in December 2019. Zach was supposed to be with us, but had to cancel last minute. But I do have the TV star who ignores me and makes me feel invisible in our own marriage-like friendship, Devin Michaels is here. I, I deny everything. <laughs> and Devin, this is our very first uh, interview. Are you excited? This is great. I think this is a interesting little uh, part of the society now. Well, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully we'll get to do more. This is the first one. It's a, a flagship voyage, if you will. I'm gonna drink Guinness uh, tonight. Uh, left over from one of the CMSs. And also, um, back when we reviewed the show back in 2019, I wore a green hat, albeit a, a green Yankee hat. It was a little older. I got a newer version. And we had Emma behind me. So we're recreating it to some degree, Devin, sort of capture that magic once again. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Before we bring in our guests, here is the schedule of the episodes that we just completed. Our 67th series of episodes that started on Wednesday, November 24th, with the review of the current feature Ghostbusters Afterlife. Continued on Monday, November 29th, with our indie spotlight Captain Fantastic from 2016. Last Thursday, December 2nd, was our classic movie discussion of the 1988 film Earth Girls Are Easy, which Devin was a part of. Devin was also part of our last sound off on Monday, December 6th. Zach did a Below the Line segment. All three of us did an obscure movie vault related to tonight's interview, and I counted down the top five sci-fi comedies of all time. Remember that, Devin? That was uh, fun, but very controversial. Very controversial. So you can go back and look at that episode to uh, figure out what he's talking about. We almost came to blows. It wouldn't be the first time. All right, guys, it is time for introduce our guest for our first ever interview episode of the No Name Center Society. Ladies and gentlemen, the co-writers of Downloading Nancy, Lee H. Ross. Hi, Lee. Hey, we're glad to be here. And Pamela Cumming. Hi, Pamela. Hey. <laughs> Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much for, for doing this. It's, uh, we're, I, I, and I apologize, Zach couldn't be here, but uh, uh, it, uh, we're very excited that, uh, that you guys uh, you know, reached out to us, Lee reached out to us, to, and uh, it, we're, we're very pumped to do this, and it should be a lot of fun. It's good that Zach had work tonight because uh, you know, it keeps our being more symmetrical. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, Devin likes the boxes. He, <laughs> he, likes, he likes he likes symmetry in his life and uh, on his screen. So um, every, every once in a while, guys, uh, a, a movie comes along that just hits you on a visceral gut level. And I had that experience with downloading Nancy, both in 2009 and then again in 2019 when we reviewed the movie for our show. Um, I think Devin did as well. So first, guys, let me say to you, congratulations uh, on behalf of us for Thank turning out a movie that had such impact, at least at least on us. Thank you. Yeah, I um, appreciate it. It was. Sorry, go ahead. I just it was so great to hear your original ten year review. That you know it was really cool. Um, so for the sake of the audience, I know you guys know the summary, but I'm going to quickly rattle off a summary of the of the film per our tradition. I mean, obviously, you figure if someone's watching this, they've probably seen the film, but just. Uh, as a springboard for our discussion. Uh, we always do a summary at the beginning of these episodes. So downloading Nancy. Albert comes home to find his wife, Nancy, has left him a note saying she has gone to visit a friend in Baltimore. What he doesn't realize is that Nancy is visiting a male friend that she met online, whom she hopes can help her with her deep depression caused by abuse as a young child. I just recycled the same summary I used two years ago when we reviewed the show. I hope it's acceptable to you guys, the writers. Yeah. It's just a, it's just a take. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah, that is a basic <laughs> I summary. I mean, if you want to go further with it, you'd say he meets the guy on the internet to ask him a special favor. Right, right. I was trying to be vague on that point. Which, you know, but, which ends a certain way. 
Right, right. And, you know, I'll leave it up to you guys, you know, if we, how much we want to reveal in the Q&A. Um, I, I, um, and I just want to say one disclaimer is I, because I like the, these two things to be more conversational, I didn't do like a ton of research, like, so I know all the answers in advance. I'm more, I'd rather more hear things from you. So if I, if I ask things like about budget or whatever, I'd rather hear from you than like starting to dig on the internet and figure things out. Um, so, but before we get into the nuts and bolts of the script, I'd like to tie this discussion to the show itself just at first. After all, Lee, it was you who tracked us down, which we're very grateful for. So presumably you watched our review of your movie, um, as, as you intimated earlier. Um, so my first question uh, is, and I'll give you the chance for the inverse of this as well, but what, was there one thing from our review that you were particularly pleased about? Uh, you intimated that you liked some of what we had to say. So what, for each of you, what was your favorite thing that we had to say on our review? So um, I'll, I'll hop in first. Um, you know, it was it was just such a great surprise that you guys had actually sat down and said, we're going to watch this movie. Very few people know about it. It's the guy who directed Chernobyl and Breaking Bad, but it took him many years to get there. And this is his only movie. And in researching, downloading Nancy on the web and just the very few articles and particularly YouTube reviews, there's only a couple. So it was just such a thrill to hear this film and script and the cinematography and everything spoken about, including the story, of course, by you guys in depth. And that was just a thrill. I sent it immediately to Pamela and we shared it as well. The reason we got to do the movie is I had seen it as a, as a voter for the Independent Spirit Awards mm. back in 2009. So Pamela, he said he sent it along to you. Anything that you remember from the review that you liked? You know, it was a while ago. I don't remember specifics. I remember what I felt, felt that somebody got it. You guys got it. And that was, um, I was really, I just felt really good. I felt very grateful and I was just so glad that you guys kind of picked up on it without being so negative about the outcome and stuff. Because that movie had to end the way it did because that's the way it ended. I was just really appreciative that you seemed to just get the essence of the film and you had some compassion for it because it's a really hard story. I don't want to speak for Devin, but for me, saying that we got it means a lot to me, like as just audience members that to you, the creatives, that you felt like we understood what you were doing. Like Devin, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but that means a lot to me. That yeah, I definitely appreciate that as well. And rewatching it to prepare for tonight, I felt like I, I got it more. That brings up the inverse, of course. I did promise the opportunity. And so we, you know, we it wasn't like all glowing, like Devin and I particularly both I think we're really very positive about the film, but we had some questions, we had some things. I know Pamela's a little fuzzier on her memory. Was there one thing that you guys didn't like? What was the least, the thing you liked the least about what we said, or maybe we misunderstood or got wrong? Do you guys remember? Well, I loved when you guys came around to just like, was it a, you know, basically a thumbs up or not for you, for each of you in, in the, you know, are, would you recommend this film? And I think pretty much all, ex, except for, um, I think he was a little more on the fence. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in hindsight, I think he has, he did rewatch it for tonight before he knew he couldn't make it. And he was, does appreciate it more, but he does, he has some questions and I'll get to these about some of the mental health aspects of it um, that, you know, we had, we had a separate discussion about because we have different interpretations of it. But I mean, I think, to, to the point you sort of alluded to earlier, I think Zach was uncomfortable with the material more than anything else. Pamela, you said it's a hard movie. So in yeah. that way, it's it's hard for people to love unless they're in a certain place in time. I have family members who were originally like, I'm gonna watch it, I'm gonna see it. And they can watch Tarantino uh, blowing people's heads off, but they couldn't watch yeah. our film. And that yeah. I'm like, and it's family. Pamela also has had certain- no, My mother, she watched the film and she had a piece of paper and she was ready to oh, come yeah. up in my face. You know, it really doesn't cut away from those difficult moments that most people never see. As an editor, Johan always cut away at the perfect time. Lee, I don't know, you were sort of dancing around Zach a little bit. Was there something that you didn't like about the review? I don't know if I got an actual answer on Oh, that. no, no. It was great to hear three different perspectives and it was really full. Whenever I've done interviews in the past, I've always been fascinated by origins, specifically that first spark of the idea, that first kernel that starts to percolate in the gray manner. So for you guys, where did downloading Nancy start for you guys 
was it first? Were you guys already working together? You know, was it as simple as reading about Sharon Lepop uh, Lepotka in a newspaper? Like, how did how did we start to come to this place that no, this this was a movie, this was a screenplay? So um, Pamela and I met as actors originally in Boulder, Colorado. I had a script at that time called Threshold. She had something called Jane and Mabel. We put together these readings. Over the years, we've gotten really good at just being comfortable with understanding where we're coming from. Downloading Nancy, as you guys know, is the real story of Sharon Lepotka and the very first time the internet was ever really used for murder. When I read the four paragraphs of the Associated Press article in the Daily Camera newspaper over a coffee. It was just four little paragraphs, not very specific. And I loved the challenge of, oh, great, it's a love story. Lee had this story that he was really drawn to, and he wrote a draft. And he said, you know, just do whatever you think you need to do with it. Just take it, because I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this. <laughs> I can't do any more with this. And when I read it, I was married at the time. I was very unhappy. I was very lonely in my marriage. I found the loneliness that Nancy was experiencing. I had to explore that. And I knew that her situation, her psychology was so much worse than mine. It took it that much further. But I understood that the basis of it was severe loneliness and mixed in with a little bit of, you know, past situations with unhealthiness psychologically and behavior but when lee gave me the script i was like i have to i have to take this i think i took it for three months i had a friend in while i was living in la she came to me one day while we were at some kind of social gathering she just said hey what have you got i need something that's like a couple of locations drama she's newly living with her her boyfriend who started his own production company so out of the blue at another gathering, her boyfriend comes over to me and he goes, hey, do you, do you have a second? And he goes, listen, I stole the script off of my girlfriend's night table and we want it. Him and his per partner in their new company. And, um, and then they ended up kind of calling us individually when they broke up. And it was this crazy thing. Like, are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with him? It you know, been worse. it was just crazy. It's, uh, it's funny because whenever strangers come up to you and say, I want your script, I'm always a little skeptical. Like it says something about JB's psychology, but that is so uh, true. Uh, okay. I, I thought it and I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to stop that train before it goes further. <laughs> you know, I, at the time it was just so strange because I didn't re we didn't really know this guy very well, but he was tenacious and he somehow he was, yeah had a connection to Johan, who was going through his own destruction of his marriage, gets the script and says, oh yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. He... How accurate is that Johan impression, out of curiosity? Is that dead on? It's not good. <laughs> no. I'll take it. But he... So it sounds like you read an article while sitting in a coffee shop. I forget the name of the, the, the restaurant, but I remember it's four headlines. Uh, and I forget the name of the newspaper as well. So then you took those four paragraphs, you know, had an idea when you fill in the blanks for yourself, wrote a script, handed it to Pamela, and then she started working on it for a couple months. And, and, and then, you know, it sort of evolved from there. Do I basically have the timeline? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And Got it all. Yes. Yeah. Got all over the place. I wanted to make sure I pieced it together. No, that's it. <laughs> Did either so, of you do like, additional research during that time? Something beyond Sharon Lepaka's case? more just digging into the mental health issues surrounding the subject matter or yeah. pamela wrote all of the therapy scenes and brought that whole character that amy brenneman plays into the script i think there was a little bit of research maybe on pamela's side because boulder is full of therapists we don't have any here in la it's so strange <laughs> <laughs> that's right no, you have to do some research and you have to research what the psychology of a cutter and that kind of sexual abuse in childhood. And Can we dig into the weeds a little bit? Like exactly how did you go about that research? Did you talk to people? Or was it just book research? Like what did you do for screenwriters out there? You know, start on the internet and watch a lot of videos on psychology and abuse and self afflictions. And, and then I sort of internalized that myself and kind of find out what would make what would that what would that be if that was inside of me if i had those desires i you know i met a few people that kind of went there and 
talk to them and you know just as much research as I can. And they were, they were open to talking to you like there there was a comfort level there. Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't say 100%. I don't know all the whole stories but of everyone but just to get the idea and try to absorb what that pain is like. Also, it must have been, it must have been draining. Like sometimes when I write emotional scenes, like I actually like have trouble going to sleep that night. I I, I don't know if like everybody's different, but that I this didn't particular find it subject. I didn't find it you draining didn't... at all. No, well, that's interesting. I, no, because uh, I was curious. I wanted yeah. to understand it. So yeah. it kept feeding me. It wasn't draining at all. It wasn't even depressing. It was dark. It was just feeding me creatively to understand this person who was going through this stuff, uh, kind of uh, enlivening. Once again, to Devin's point, I, I might be a strange one in that regard. Also strange in the sense that I actually <laughs> frequently have trouble collaborating with co-writers. I find that a very frustrating process. Collaborate in this and collaborate in many things. It sounds like you guys still collaborate. Is that correct? We are oh, still exploring it. It's been so long since we've actually sat down and said, okay, let's well, write. Well, not long because before the pandemic, we were doing right on 1031. You know, we had director oh, and yeah, Australia. That's true. We had two producers. We were almost in pre-production. And then exciting. the pandemic yeah. hit. Our projects kind of come and go depending on the season. You guys do individual projects. You do projects together. And yep. it sounds like, and maybe it's a mix of this, but... I always am curious, like how people collaborate. Do they sit down together? But it sounds like one of you does pages or, or a full draft, and then the other one does a full draft, and then back no, and forth. No, 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 no. I mean, it really changes. But you know, Lee okay. and I have we each have something that the other one doesn't have, and so we just kind of figure out. Well, this is your scene, and this will be your scene, and you know, I'll take that, and you take that. And for some reason, our styles just kind of blend pretty well. Not 100%, but pretty well. I can take some guesses, but why don't you spell it out for me? What is the thing that Lee has that you don't and vice versa? Like, you know, you said you're, you have you have something he doesn't have and vice versa. I think what I'm is... really good with character, dialogue, emotional, emotional connections, with all the emotional stuff. And I Lee's the structure guy? Dialogue. I think Lee is really good with um, concept. And you know anything that's a little more complex, I think he's very good with that. And I do think he's good with dialogue too. And our dialogue mixes, I think, pretty well. But mm -hmm. um, just for me personally, I think that I'm the emotional person. I'm the one that adds in like the punches. Bring yeah. in the punches. She's yeah, like I, the closer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of the time I pour the foundation and put up the framing and then Pamela and I fill in all of the wiring. Pamela then adds the very fine details uh, of finishing the house. In terms of wanting to know anything more about Sharon Lapaka, it was not until we had finished a number of drafts that I finally allowed myself to do some real research on the murder. What was the most interesting thing that sent some chills up my spine? Most of the time, the name that Sharon Lapaka used as an alias, which I had no idea about, was Nancy in every sadomasochistic chat room. Maybe it's a sign too, like you found the right project. It sounds like this production company that you guys uh, went to that, that, that found you a boyfriend of a friend or whatever, and then there was like a bidding war between his partner. So, so we got that part. You know, how did they, if you know, go about financing the film? Did, did they all self-finance? Was it all equity? Was there some pre-sales or soft money involved? What do you guys know about that part of the process? Mark Johnson helped put in, put together, on, you know, Mark Johnson. I mean, David Moore uh, refinanced his house. One producer yeah. financed his house. So it was the per personal. It was all the producer's personal personal funding. Personal, well, there are guys who yeah. personal money, but some of it was. There was no pre-sales you know, of had, any kind for dis distribution. I don't think there were any pre-sales. I think they raised. Uh, money. I I, I think, think there was work. maybe something. Was maybe with know. the Wild Bunch once they came on for Europe, um, that happened that maybe was before. Later, wasn't you know. It? Unfortunately, these guys didn't even want a website till it was too late. They were so confident with Maria Bello and Jason, and we were not part of our own film in many ways during Sundance, even though we were there. It is a director-driven film festival. They thought they were going to get a big sale. It was really hard to watch the premiere where the actors were on stage with Johan, and there were certain questions that he was fumbling to answer. Suddenly, Jason, he just looked down and he went, this is bullshit. He said it loud enough that the front rows could hear and he just walked off. 
And this is while they're answering questions about the film. Who is he mad at exactly? Well, he's a really intense, weird dude to begin with. Um, (laughs) I've had some experience, not directly, but uh, you know, I I saw him on Broadway and I had some friends in Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. During this process, because we review a lot of different films, we review indies, we review classics, uh, you know, current features. Were there uh, films that you guys either watched or referenced for uh, inspiration during the writing process specifically. Of, um, is is so there no in, answer that's possible? There's no answer in, for in me the, because I don't have one. The, I really didn't yeah. research in films. I wanted it to be fresh. Just the, the information that we got from the, the newspaper clippings. And for me, I just want it to be as organic as possible. Johan Rank, he says, Lee, you know, I want you to watch Irreversible. Gaspar Noé. Yeah, I think Monica Bellucci is in it in the longest rape scene. It's just brutal. I do not enjoy this film. But that was what Johan was like, you need to see this. But that's the kind of visceral energy I want to bring to this script. Interesting. I don't know if he accomplished that visceral energy, but what I think he found was a good happy medium. I think he found the right tone for this piece, because I don't know if that specific kind of energy would have been right. The score is so wonderful. Christer Linder and his score pummel you with that droning monotony, and it's just wonderful. You you. know, if you want to say dialogue is on the nose, the tone was a little bit on the nose. It was very intentionally on the nose. What can you do to that? was their creative interpretation what i felt while watching it if i may is i i felt it really put us inside the helplessness of the maria bello character yeah i used the word when we started films that give you a visceral gut punch and i think that tone added to that we were inside her heart really with this this tonal choice that's my interpretation of it But I think that's part of what was a positive to me that that maybe Zach found as a negative. Switching gears slightly, we talked about the chronology of the cast getting involved. Is it Mary Vernu who eventually got a hold of Maria Bello? Jason Patrick, did they hear about it through channels? Like, I know Holly Hunter was first, William Hurt was first. How did the scripts get to Maria Bello or how did they find out about it? It went everywhere. It went to Kevin Bacon. I mean, that script went to everybody. At the time, the buzz around Johan pre- Breaking Bad and other things was like this really amazing, well-known music video wonder kid is doing his first dark movie. People were like, I want to read some shit if Johan Rank is directing. That's interesting. Yo, so Johan was the bait. He was Johan, the... such a huge name at that time for, from being a musician. His group was called Stakabo. And you could look up his music. I could if I spoke That's so crazy. <laughs> 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 Devin was specifically, he was very effusive about Rufus Sewell on the show. So I, he had some questions about Rufus specifically. Well, yeah, just at what point was that choice first entertained and then executed? I found the casting of Rufus Sewell in that role was particularly fascinating. I remember him being that interesting, sexy, younger actor. Devin's aging this, himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so in this film, all of a sudden, he's this older, middle-aged frumpy guy. How was the idea of Rufus Sewell first brought up? I remember like just it was announced. David sent us an email and just said, hey, we got Rufus. And we were like, great. He's one of the nicest guys. Super Very friendly. Great. Yeah, awesome. He was the of the cast. We Very were like, gracious. Very respectful. He was great. As opposed to Jason Patrick. Jason Patrick (laughs) was not very pleasant at all. Well, he's he's so hard to read. Well, I don't think Maria Bell wasn't very pleasant either, to tell you the truth. She's a little snotty. That's that's disappointing. I hate to say it, but she was. I appreciate the candor. I I love it. That sort of segues to my next question is like, how much were you guys on set? And what was that experience like? We didn't go to set. We did not go on set. But but I was. I, I had to rewrite an entire scene for a different location until, I think it took about until 3, 3.30 in the morning. And then somebody was at the other end in Canada waiting for the pages. So we were working, we were right, just doing offset. changes, but we just weren't there. It was just um, remote. So, I mean, like in terms of Maria Bello and Jason Patrick, were they unhappy with the material? Were they unhappy with Johan? Like what, why were they? So I don't think it was about uh, being unhappy. Yeah, I think they, they were, were really they interested were into their roles, and they really were emotionally charged by delving into these roles. It was a methody was, kind of thing. Yeah, and I also think Jason Patrick is kind of not a really very pleasant person. Maybe he resents being in the business for so long. I'm not really sure. But I think for Maria, she was just jumping into the role, and she just was very focused 
And so she yeah. wasn't that pleasant. She right. did walk up to us when we did the reading. She walked straight up to us and we were standing yeah. in the back. The reading, and she but... looked us in the eyes and she just said, you guys are great writers. Yeah. And that was very cool. It's all you need. The kind whole thing true. with Maria and Jason, actors get to the point in their career where they're more interested in getting in the the gym rink and sparring you know they don't care about too many other things other than i want to immerse myself in this character and you want to go crazy in that character and let's see what these two chemical concoctions do when they meet you know that's why i i love the scene at the restaurant the asian restaurant scene is just absolutely one of the great scenes of that film for me i'm off script again but i'm curious now that we're talking about her at one point in the review i actually said that Marie Bell's performance in this film may have been the best of that decade. Was that, uh, you know, I, I may, they make fun of me sometimes for my overstatements, but I still believe that. Is that overreaching for you guys or do you feel happy with her work? For me, I wanted to see a little bit more humor here and there, even more sarcastic humor. She really was committed in the role and I thought that was really amazing. But honestly, I felt like she pushed a little bit here and there. That kind of acting for me is just can be a little bit over the top but I thought she was very good. There are only a couple of laugh out loud moments that are just are so many, but I mean, give know, us like a little something. Office. That speaks to something I felt about the character that really worked as dark and bleak as it is. It really worked for me and seemed very real to me. The way that the character of Nancy is almost pompous Yes. Her, her pain makes her pompous. I yeah, think she really yes. nailed that. And I think the script nailed that. And I think yeah. the performance nailed that um, to such a T. And it could even have translated to some of her demeanor between cut and action as well. Yeah. Because of, sure. of how deep she was in that and, and playing that. Performance means a lot to me. I, I just think it's exquisite acting to me personally. I that you had that response. JB loves um, when people are pompous in any way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so connected to it. As you had intimated about Johan's lack of interest in rehearsals. Are you willing to expound upon that? And uh, if so, how did the actors respond to the lack of rehearsal time or even rehearsals on set? You know, because of the improvisational nature of music videos and how they script and it's all about the look, the style from down, from up, this lighting, this effect, that effect and it's lip synced. And this is all secondhand hearing from the producers, but basically the actors were like, what are you talking about? Of course we're going to rehearse, you know? And, and then uh, I think, you know, it was a trial by fire at the time, I think for Johan. I wanted to bring up one of my favorite scenes in the film, There's this beautiful exchange between Nancy and Lewis in the dress shop. It's this series of lines of dialogue that could easily have been exchanged between people in a completely different environment, in a much more, shall we say, typically romantic kind of context. Was the writing of that scene purposely romantic? To me, it was like both characters, not the actors, but the characters were consciously choosing to play a scene with each other. Right. In which they were playing with the idea of being in a romance or being in a love story. Was that purposeful? And what else can you tell me about the writing of that particular scene? That scene is about seduction. You know, it's, it's about them both in a very non-conventional way seducing each other, for me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not necessarily a love scene, but there is, there is a point where it becomes genuine. At first, it's not really genuine. When you say at first, you mean at first in... In the scene or at first yeah. in the story? No, first in the scene, it's there's a, a tenuous about it. They're not totally linked. And then there's a one little moment where they kind of link up emotionally and it shifts. We were getting at your psychology, JB, earlier. Now we've gotten at mine because I read Seduction as Love. <laughs> <laughs> it is that, which is very, very on point. That's on brand, Pamela, well, if you know him. Well, we talked about th this next question a little bit, but not necessarily in, in detail. Devin started saying he started to appreciate the structure, whereas on the show, we didn't as much. The non-sequential narrative element. What we weren't sure about is if it was a script choice or something they found in the It was a script room. choice. That was definitely our structure. You know what? It just evolved that way. It just kind of felt like it needed to be that. And they liked it. I loved it myself. I thought it was interesting. Do you remember your specific reasons behind it? It was intuitive. An emotional intuition of the, the proper way to tell the story. 
it wasn't like, oh, you write this on the board and you're going to put this scene here and that scene there. It just, it just kind of, uh, it was like a puzzle, it just kind of worked together as a puzzle. And some people might not like that, but for us, it just needed to be that way. And, and okay. it evolved. We're touching on a lot of the things that were very successful in the film. And, but what about the inverse of that? Looking back, especially this many years later, are there things that, that you, that the two of you would do differently now in terms of how you approach the script or even how you approach the rest of the process? Because we are the rights holders and to the IP, we didn't understand at that time that I could have attached myself and Pamela as producers. We could have been, had, we could have had a say in the whole process. Understand There's a business that. do-over that you'd like, not necessarily a, a creative do-over, but a business do-over. Having gone through uh, producing and writing a half dozen shorts over these years and Pamela also directing and producing. And I think we would just would, uh, for me, I would have loved to been involved in the whole thing much more. But at the time we just were like, oh, we're the writers, you know. You guys are not the first writers I've heard that from, believe it or not. <laughs> it's shocking to learn. Pamela, is that, do you have the same answer or is there something else? No, I I, know, I didn't want to be a producer. I don't feel like we should have been producer. For me, I, I it was uh, it was great. It was great the way it was and an incredible learning experience. And, you know, some of it was very intense and kind of intimidating and Sundance was a little bit intimidating and really exciting and it was fabulous. For me, I just feel like it's part of the journey and I don't have any regrets about anything at it's all. It's very circumspect. Regrets, I feel like is almost a strong word. I think, I mean, I don't wanna speak for Devin, but the question stems from, we'll look at something that we did 10 years ago, like, oh man, I wish I had more extras in that scene or, you know, like, I, or I wish I had a different dialogue here. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Obviously it's a great film. It's always interesting to hear the creatives, like, if they could have done it over, but I mean, the business do over, that's completely legitimate. And yeah, you know, live and learn. It's all good. My, my, my final question, I think Devin is a follow up, but my final question related to downloading Nancy anyway is uh, we concluded our review talking about the perception of the themes, our perception of the themes of the film. So we know what the film is about to us. And uh, Pamela was very kind and early on saying that we got it. Uh, so, so, you know, what, but to you guys, what we talked about. Uh, mental health that we talked about the right to die as the creatives behind it what was the film about to you was it the same or is there something else that you wanted to convey that we didn't necessarily articulate on the show <laughs> save the as biggest said, question for last Leah. yeah, yeah I, I, know, I, I, it's the bring us home uh, question for me when I read the story I thought wow what a twisted thing and has at its heart to people who are terribly disfigured emotionally and yet find a way to connect and come together. When we get to the end and Jason finally puts his hands for real and there's no cutting away, I was like, there we go. That's that's it. So, I mean, like, it's almost like sounds like it's it's really about love and the power of love and what it can do. And but but also like there's this it's almost sounds like you're saying from a modern point of view and the way we get in our own heads, there, there's, it's this double-edged sword. They were falling in love, or and Pamela said that at least Jason Patrick was, I could argue that they both yeah. were potentially, but they were so inside their own heads and been so damaged, it was difficult for them to acknowledge that. So it, like, it's the, it's the double-edged power of love, what to bring together, but also to prevent us from coming together. That's how I interpret what you're saying. Yeah, it, it, it self, imploded there was no way it could ever be but that's about not just... loving yourself i mean she was incapable of loving herself she she detested herself but she detested herself because of her sexual abuse, abuse. yeah the sadness to me is you know you cannot you can't allow love to come into you even though it's there you want it you can't allow it you didn't love yourself enough so, so and I mean, so from that point of view, loving yourself almost becomes a priority before connecting with someone else. You need to love yourself in order to love or be loved. You kind of match up with somebody kind of where they're at. She found him and, you know, he was kind of in a similar place. Right. Like racially, but I think. It feels similar. It feels yeah. parallel, you yeah, know, kind of, certainly. Exactly. And what he did to her broke him further. That to me was the instigation for him to do what he then did, tormenting. Yeah. Well, tormenting that's the, the right to the die, and that's that piece mm -hmm. of it. And, and, and that's the, the beautiful irony, I think, of the ending having to 
follow through with itself. Yeah. The theme that we hadn't really talked about much before was, was the theme of mercy that comes through love and sacrifice yeah, that comes that, through love. Yeah, so that's a great way. Yep, absolutely. And they are at a similar level of <laughs> brokenness. Of brokenness, and, yeah. And the irony of, of that bringing them together and creating this love out of nothingness, but also the, the fact that it's inevitable that it has to therefore go the way it goes yeah. and the mercy that comes with that. She's too deep. She, the, the pain is too deep. And that's, that's what we're talking about the show. Like in uh, the panel has talked about it too, the right to die, because it's, at some point are people too far gone? What right do we have? Like if it is just too painful, we want to help people. We don't want people to do that. But I mean, like at some point, you know, there's euthanasia, the old fashioned way for people that are terminally ill. If someone is so damaged that breathing is so utterly painful, like, is it our job to say, no, you can't do this? Like, it's a dark yeah. thought. It is sort of an interesting thing that I took from the movie. Is it our right not to make it political? Well, it's a good was... question. You know, Night Mother, that play is a fabulous play, Night Mother. Yeah. It's and on the show this year, we're studying the films from 1986 and the film version of Night Mother is from <laughs> 1986. So yeah. we're going to be watching that. I'm going to switch gears here if I, if I could, because because uh, in preparation for tonight, uh, since we knew we were going to be talking to you guys, we all, Zach included, Zach, Devin, and I all watched another film written by Lee called Benjamin Troubles but from, by, from 2015, directed by Kai Efron. And so we reviewed it in our obscure movie vault segment on the show on the sound off right. uh, not, too, not too long ago. And so if you don't mind, Lee, with the time we have left, we'd like to ask you a few questions about Benjamin Troubles. Pamela, I don't know if you have any involvement in this one. You're no, welcome to no. stick around, but if you want to peace out, that's okay too. I don't want to waste your time. I probably will peace out. I, I don't have any involvement with it. Pamela, before you go, do you have any closing thoughts or about tonight or about the, the movie overall that, that you wanted to share? I want to give you a last opportunity to... Um, you know, thank you very much. I, I don't really have anything to say. I'm really pleased that um, you cared enough about the the film and the writing and the whole thing to have us on and talk about it and um and i think the subject matter is really important and so no just thank you very much i appreciate it and i thank you for coming on and thank you thank you both for for doing the movie like because I, I do think it's important and and congratulations like i, I think it was, it was devin or somebody said it's an it's an achievement just to get something made uh, like we all know how hard it, was it is. Crazy. It was and definitely so crazy. Congratulations yeah. on that as yeah. well, and and for achieving something that has that touched people. You, you know, I know not everybody loves it, but it touched us, and it touched more yeah. people. It's, it's you know, seven thousand plus on YouTube are watching our review, so it's you know, it's it's not nothing. You know what I mean? Like that is that is something. So thank you to Pamela as thank we shift you. gears uh, on our end, and and good okay. luck and stay in, stay in touch, Pamela. All right, I will, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Good night. And it, it's time for me to switch my background now because it's time for us to talk about Benjamin Troubles, directed by Kai Efron. We reviewed it the other night, had a whole little segment on it. And as before, just a quick plot overview for the sake of the audience. A down yes. on his luck artist slash ex-drug dealer gets given a pair of jeans, which magically supplies a hundred dollar bill in its pocket every hour on the hour, which simultaneously improves, but also complicates his life at the same time. Lee, is that a fair summary? That is a very fair summary of BT. I'd like to start at the same place. It's a unique story. Origin. Where did this rather unique idea come from? I went to high school with Kai, and Kai and I went to the original high school of the performing arts in New York as actors. Fame! So, the fame school. So <laughs> my classmates were Isai Morales, Helen Slater. Jennifer and, Aniston? Uh, no, she was at LaGuardia uh, oh. uh, about five years later. So I'm class of 82 and Kai is class of 83. We've known each other since he used to have crazy parties. He's a top locations guy, so he's worked with a lot of big names. This project was scraped together. I wrote that script in four weeks. One draft and a polish, and pretty I, much. I, I, we'll, we'll get to all that process, but I mean, like, so, but I do want to start at the beginning. The very beginning is I was in a secondhand store on Melrose. I got a pair of jeans and I put them on. I'm like, damn, these fit good. Yeah, <laughs> I look good in these secondhand torn jeans. And I put my hand in the back pocket and there's a 20. I'm like, oh, snap, a 20. Yeah. Back, back when just... they said snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> so I sat there and I said to myself over the next week or so, I was like, too bad it wasn't a 50. What if some guy had the genes that actually produce a, you know, a 50? And then I started doing the math. I was like, well, how much would that be 24 seven in one week? What do you end up with with 50? And I was like, not enough. It's not enough to really have problems. Um, and then I was like, you know, what if the guy was given these genes and how long will it take him through having the worst freaking day that you could have? You get fired from your job, you get your bag stolen. Finally, you're sitting there with your last five bucks in your shorts and some homeless guy's like, don't let them do to you what they did to me. And lo and behold, he discovers snap a hundred dollars. <laughs> so you had this real life incident, which is very cool. How long was this development process? It sounded like you had this idea and then years later it sort of developed into something. How long was this process? You know, it wasn't that long. A lot of my concepts incubate for a few years. Kai called me. Somehow we got this movie made for, you know, 200. So that um, was my next question. My next question is about budget. So it sounded like 200 grand. Where did the money, what, where did the money come from? Literally deferred cobbled together so many people all the all uh, the actors all the on-screen talent was deferred it was participation on the back with some kind of sag ultra low it was your typical la shoot in 2010 run and gun it sounds like the project was like always on thin ice it sounds like tenuous at all turns <sighs> Every, we had a day on set where we were just like our money person, you know, our accountant just came up and he was a pothead too. And he was just like, uh, we're out of money. Out of money. <laughs> I had that conversation on my feature too. The day before we started shooting, they were like, oh, we're not going to finish. Well, one thing that we agreed on when we were reviewing it was the promise of the lead actor. Mono and to Raimi, I think. I think he was on one of the Star Treks. Mono. There was a sincerity to him. There was a, a charm to him. There was some real nuance in terms of how his arc progressed over the course of the movie. Even when certain other things were becoming chaotic, his choices seemed very specific and appropriate. He would be thrilled to hear that because he was second guessing everything and looks back on it and said, I didn't bring my full game. You mentioned you were already friends with Kai. How did he get involved with Benjamin Troubles and what do you feel he brought to the table? He has a lot of experience as a locations manager on some, you know, Hancock, Spider-Man, you name it. He's, he's, he's been, you know, I think he got influenced, of course, by seeing major name directors that he was working for have these enormous apparatuses taking care of him. I know we have to, <laughs> a of I would come over to the, where they were shooting and I'd be like, I didn't, I didn't write that. What's going on? I, I didn't write any of that. And he'd be like, oh no, we shot, we shot what you wrote. Now we're, now we're in the, you know, the fun. We're doing the thing. Yeah, we're just spitballing means... it now. Yeah, he would let Manu and Miles, you know, there were lots of improvised things. Or we had a location where it was like, we have an hour 40 here. That's it. It happens a lot. Do you frown on the improv? Because sometimes you can find something magical and stuff like that. A lot of times not, depending on the talent level of the actors. I know a lot of directors that do that. I work with a lot of young directors, unfortunately, these days, because I'm a little older. I feel like they read that in a book somewhere, give the actors the take to do what they want. The director gives them no guidance, so often goes nowhere. Is improv just verboten as far as you as the writer's concerned? Or it was just the improv that they were doing was just so off base? Oh, God, no. They, they you know, first of all, it, it still becomes, you know, I wrote that. If it's yeah. good, you wrote it, right? Uh, if it's good. <laughs> and there's plenty of stuff that ended up in there that I was like, that just works. And, and Manu and Philip are excellent improvisers they would roll onto set and they were just ready to have more fun and i know Michelle you haven't seen our, and... our review but i did call out their relationship as, as being one of the stronger elements now. i have zero attachment because when kai came to me you know he's just like what do you got and it's like a drug deal and i was just like i would like to write for you a one location horror movie out in the arizona desert in one location and we will maximize. And he and he was like, well, what else do you have? And I was like, magic jeans. And he was like, I want to do magic jeans. <laughs> I mean, I, was like, I would too. If given the choice, if those are my only options, I might have chosen the same. I've got some couple nitty gritty questions, uh, you know, that before I hand it off to Devin, um, uh, you know, just detail stuff. So it sounds, it sounds like he wanted to do his first feature as a filmmaker and came to you and you just had some stuff in the pile and, and you passed it along. But you came on as a producer. Is that, is that... 
Yes, uh, and I brought working. a lot of the talent, a lot of of so much. I I fifty percent produced that. I took myself off did you, as a. Did producer. you put any money in yourself? May I ask? Yes, yes, I did. Okay. Um, um, it's always dangerous, but it has to be done sometimes. How many days was the shoot? Just three weeks, maybe. Just Fifteen days or weeks. six day weeks or five day weeks? We did six day weeks, and then we did a final recon for a weekend for five grand down to Tijuana for the Tijuana mm -hmm. race. Oh, and, um, yeah. Okay. Casino. 18 days is actually not bad. I can't tell you how many shoots that I get offered were 12 day features. My mm. next question was, how did production go? But it sounds like you answered it. I mean, it sounds like it was the constant race against the clock could have fallen through at any given point. We had one night that went till four or five in the morning at the loft for the poker game. You know, well, that might be uh, fine if you started AD, at four in the uh, afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> there were there were so many things. But I didn't have enough time as a real, you know, strategist and writer to just sit back and go, okay, I'm now going to get a second draft or a third draft and really condense this thing down and have it make more sense. <laughs> Fair enough. Devin, what was your next question? Well, so, so, you know, now that you're not running around giving the actors lifts to a certain location or grabbing lenses that should have been there. Have you had a chance to revisit it? Like, like, yeah. when, when did you last rewatch the film and, and when you did in this more relaxed, you know, after the fact perspective, what, what was your favorite aspect of it? I'm glad we got to make it. I'm glad it, it is one of my only, you know, as far as features, it's my only feature as a solo writer. But, but I look back and I just loved the camaraderie and the craziness and my memories of being on set. What you didn't answer in that question is if you had a favorite scene in the current iteration of Benjamin Trouble. Man, you know... I think there's just three or four scenes that I just really enjoy. Philip Andre. I have my one cameo, and I didn't know they were shooting. Does that count as the a cameo? Hookah, <laughs> the hookah bar. They're improving the check my pocket, check my pocket, busting a chubby. I never wrote that. But I walk by on the window, but outside, you just see me uh... look in the window as I walk by in my little stupid hat. That's one of my favorite scenes. For of sure. course. I mean, yeah, if you're in it, especially. Philip Andre was fun in the improv moments. In the other moments, not as grounded, but Manu is like very consistent, sort of a less is more approach. Even in the amusing moments is very grounded, feels very honest and real. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, Devin, but I think that's what I, I appreciate yeah. about Manu. Absolutely. He, yeah, I mean, when you get to the father scene, the father-son stuff, the phone call, it all hinges on my dad is dying. So to echo a previous question that we asked about downloading Nancy, the last time you answered it in terms of business, this time it can be either creative or business. Is there something that you would like to have done differently if you were given this project today? What would you do differently? I think we'd do 80% differently. I would have gotten the chance to refine the script. I'm a much more confident writer in terms of the craft. Can you define refine? Is there something specific that you wanted to tighten? I would have eliminated uh, so much of the, you know, Kai was all excited about how many favors for how many locations he could call in and he had a list he would just say can you put it in a hookah bar oh i got this amazing car dealership with uh you know, secondhand cars it would just be a lot of times about trying to fit something into reverse engineering again you talked about reverse engineering and that and it's not the most creative of ways to go about a project he just was so gung-ho to get his first movie as a director in the can that it, you know we weren't really going to work too hard on anything other than where we got to with a draft and a polish, and then we'll we'll figure it out. Not in post, but as we went along, Kai was like, this doesn't make sense, we'll improvise it. The cars and where is Glitch and the shootout at the in San Pedro. There were some things that just kind of came together in a weird way, so it hopefully made sense. We did have some, I don't want to say issues, but we did call out the shootout at the end as being oh. a little lacking, I would say. What was the distribution process and how do you feel about how it was rolled out? Because it's on Amazon right now, I believe. You guys know indie rights and they're, they're deal they get you on the different basic streamers you know we're on itunes we're on amazon i look back and the main thing that irks me is that kai decided to work with two foreign junior editors from two different countries and him and he was ed because he wanted to give his friend lj a job which is the worst way to work. And had we had an American editor who understood comedy, I would have taken those hard drives and been like, 
dude, you're going to edit the damn movie. Kai, you're not touching it. You're not going to look at it. He's going to do my buddy. Especially Sven. comedy. Comedy is so different between cultures. Uh, to this day, I think, had my buddy Sven edited that movie. And we're just know, going to assume cult. Sven is American in spite of the name. I, yes. You, yeah. <laughs> he's first very suggestion, funny. It seems to contradict. Very funny. And he's a great editor. And I just wish we had just been like, here's the rough cut. Now go to work. We talked about the themes of Benjamin Troubles as well. And so I want to run them by you just to close things out for us. We talked about two things in terms of themes. Uh, one, of course, is money. And I, in the in the review, I used the word fable. Um, and on some level, we have here is a fairy tale about the corruptibility of money. As much as you can buy, it burdens burdens, complications, and temptations come along with that. Like mo money, mo problems. But I, we also wondered if there isn't something about the film uh, about magic in the film, not in the David Copperfield kind of way, but in the sense that sometimes just believing in something, whether that be magic genes, magic beans, a higher being, ghosts, or the power of positivity, sometimes the very belief is enough to provide hope, and sometimes that hope is enough to turn your world around. That latter one, I believe, connected with Devin a little bit more. My question to you is, Lee, what does that mean to you, our interpretation of it? How does that line up with your vision? A lot of my projects and a lot of my stuff all has either some kind of magical thing happens or some kind of tech magic you know thing happens as well and that generally connects speaking. back to downloading nancy in that regard you know the technical well, connection that they have yeah i mean uh, there is the tech on there with the old computers and all that but well also the rufus sewell character is involved in a tech company to some degree he devised this software for golf playing as i recall oh, the, yes the golf in airports uh yeah the putting lounge perhaps more you know more to the point thematically i think there is there is a common element in terms of the, the idea of, of magic, the way that I would be talking about magic in, in this film, which is uh, what, what you were alluding to earlier about just believing in something and the absolute absurdity of the universe sometimes. And so the same way that there's this bizarre, surprising magic uh, between Nancy and Lewis that you would never expect, it just comes out of nowhere. There is this sense of magic in Benjamin Troubles and, and the idea that it's not a matter of where it came from, it just happened. That in and of itself is just magic. It doesn't matter what technical way it manifested, it happened. A new perspective on believing in things happening, on believing in the universe providing, having some positive possibilities in it. And it's that lack of hope in downloading Nancy that is what they're missing. Could Nancy have been saved if she received magic genes, which sounds like a ridiculous sentence, but I mean, it's what the magic genes represent. The magic genes represented a possibility. You already alluded to, he was like, had the worst day, bad thing after bad thing, falling on him on a single day. He could have very easily taken the Nancy path. There was very little hope for him, but these genes provided that. The genes sort of represent that light that Nancy just could not find no matter how hard she tried and she'd given up trying. I think we have a sequel there between the two films. If <laughs> I love and, it. As long as Devin could uh, be in it, I'll direct it, yeah. you write it. We got a collaboration born here. We get Pamela on board to do the dialogue so, and the emotional. I'm just glad to meet you guys, man. We'll make it a uh, musical. Made, <laughs> made, yeah, make it a musical. There's that something interesting here. about that. Downloading Nancy the musical. Oh my gosh, revolutionary. Yeah. Downloading Benjamins. Oh, Benjamins yeah. the musical. Uh, Benjamin's so the musical. I mean, we, uh, we're going to close things out uh, in a second. I want, I want to thank uh, Pamela, who's, who uh, left early, uh, and Lee for sitting down with us for what, the, what is the first of what we hope will be many interviews with creatives. Lee, do you have anything that you want to say in, in closing? Uh, you know, uh, commit. Commit to your writing and commit to your process and don't give up, you know. Absolutely. And, and also, I want to thank you to Devin for joining me. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, for Pamela, Lee, Devin, and myself, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.